four tumors, and the reason for this is um, it does comprise a fairly uh, large volume of the overall consultation work that comes in, and I think part of it is just an unfamiliarity with the area. Um, and so I'd like to kind of go over just a few of the jaw lesions, um, both as cysts and tumors, that we come across here within the SCPMG group. So, of course, we always like to start off with a polling question, and so in this particular case, I'll go ahead and open the poll and uh, give you folk an opportunity to be able to answer it. And the reason why I've chosen this particular topic is um, because of Veronica's adversity to giving um, public speaking engagements, she offered me any bottle of wine from that of her husband and her cellar. So um, I thought, oh, <laughs> what better way than to start off with a wine question, therefore. And so which country produces the most wine in the world? Um, if you think about them, uh, the answers here are listed alphabetically. I have done that with all of the polling questions this evening, so there should not be anything um, untoward. There's no subliminal messaging. It is just alphabetic. So Chile, France, Italy, Spain, or the United States. And um, I'll give it just a couple of moments to see how people um, are doing with the answering. And um, I guess in the interest of time, we won't go on forever, but I'll go ahead and close the poll. So um, I think what is curious about the answers, because I've already seen them, and therefore I know um, what's going to actually show, and that is that the majority of you have put down the United States. So instead of doing that, let me give you some of the statistics here. So um, U.S. is the biggest wine consumer in the world. Uh, Spain has the largest area under agricultural um, growth. France exports the most wine by value, but it is actually Italy that produces the most wine in the world. And so um, knock yourself out and go home and have some Italian wine this evening. So if you think about uh, NAFIC jaw lesions and cysts, they're covered in the Chapter 8 of the WHO book. And you can see just from this um, snapshot of that particular chapter's cover, there actually are quite a remarkable number of entities and lesions that can affect this rather small and concentrated area within the head and neck. If you look at the various books, actually, the odontogenic book um, with the WHO was its own book for the first two series uh, in 71 and 92, but then it was rolled into the rest of the head and neck tumor book in 2005 and 2017. So one of the things that is always um, a bit annoying about what goes on um, with these particular books is there's usually some loudmouthed individual that is able to dominate the conversation. And so <clears throat> if you look at this um, edition from 1992, you will notice that the odontogenic cysts are all incorporated within the classification of the tumors. And so you'll notice I've kind of put tumors in quotations at the top. Um, however, if you go to the 2005 edition, um, conspicuous by its absence is um, there are no cysts. So for that entire edition, all of the cysts were completely removed from the categorization. Um, again, uh, in 2017, a completely different group of people were now involved in the organization of the book, and lo and behold, the cysts are now back. So this is just to tell you that there is always flux, there is always something going on with any of these type of classification schemes. But in general, um, there was an attempt to kind of simplify the classification scheme for this particular um, edition of the book. Book. And so a number of uh, lesions that had either subtypes or suffixes that didn't really have any clinical importance were removed. Um, all of the amyloblastic fibrodentinoma and fibroodontoma were collapsed into odontoma. The odontoamyloblastoma uh, was also dropped. And then there were only two new entities added in this particular section with the primordial odontogenic tumor and sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma. Now, in context, um, there are less than 20 reported cases of each of those two lesions. Um, in the uh, world's literature. And so the chance that you are going to have one is fairly remote, and this is why um, they were added in just as small sections. I will say that um, having sat at this particular meeting, um, the entire odontogenic group, and there were nine people in that section, um, argued about whether to include the cystic lesions or not, and whether they were neoplastic or not, and whether they were developmental or not, for three full days, while the rest of the book was written for all of the other chapters, and finally, um, the rest of the group actually had to vote on it uh, within a plenary session in order to come up with what the diagnostic criteria were going to be. 
So with that in mind, um, keratocystic odontogenic tumor and calcifying cystic odontogenic tumor both went away in the uh, new edition, and they were changed to odontogenic keratocyst and calcifying odontogenic cyst. Um, the reason why everyone in the United States was very agitated by that is they went from being 88307s to 88305s because they are now considered a cyst in a jaw rather than a neoplasm by the ICD-9 coding sequence. You know, whenever you think about um, what goes on with odontogenic lesions, I do think that um, a little bit of understanding about uh, the development of the tooth and its structure within the bones of the jaw are going to be helpful and significant to you. And with that, the dental lamina is really one of the most um, important components of odontogenesis, where it is the very first item to be identified. This is followed by an in, uh, I mean, a, um, inversion from the dental papillae, and then finally the amelioblast epithelium as well as the enamel matrix um, are then identified along with dentin. So if you look at the final structure of tooth um, in the F depiction, I'll show you exactly what this looks like if you look at the histology taken from one of the jaw cysts that come in uh, for evaluation. So you can tell that all of those particular components are very nicely outlined in this particular illustration to show that um, it is actually a very well-developed and sequential development that goes on um, with the tooth. So with that in mind, um, obviously the surface is covering, uh, covered by enamel. Um, there is dentin that is immediately underneath it. And then there is a crown root junction where the enamel actually comes down to be involved with the root before it goes into the rest of the bone socket. So this particular junction is significant with the developmental and odontogenic cyst categories, and I'll go over that here in a few moments. The dental pulp chamber is also present, and then, of course, the periodontal ligament is a uh, structure that surrounds the entire tooth root and is actually quite significant for odontogenic rest. And so I'm going to go over the odontogenic rest in a few moments as well, but just remember that that's where those odontogenic rests are usually identified. So if you think about this, this is a um, orthopantomograph. If you would prefer the brand name of Panorax, that's fine too. This is from a youngish patient because, of course, the four um, final molars have not yet um, erupted, and so they are seen here in the outer aspect. What is interesting is that there is a very uh, standardized approach to the naming of teeth and where lesions may be identified. And so when you get these specimens submitted from the either dental surgeon or head and neck surgeon, perhaps just a dentist out in the community sending in the patient specimen, they may give a designation of what the particular tooth number and or associated finding is. And so if you look at this, this is actually a diagrammatic representation where you start at the right upper with number one, go all the way to 16 on the upper left, drop down to the lower left with 17, and then follow all the way around the mandible to the right lower where you get to 232. So really, if you follow this arc of development from one side to the other on the upper jaw first and then dropping down to the lower jaw, um, it's very easy to be able to tell. So if someone says to you, I have a cyst next to tooth, uh, 29, they really don't actually need to tell you that it is in the mandible because you'd be able to tell it is in the right mandible area. And the advantage that we have as pathologists in this particular setting is invariably they are going to tell you where these things are taken from. If they just say jaw cyst, then you definitely need to get the clinician to give you more information. But having said that, it really is something where when you then look at the radiology or look at the radiology reporting to try and get a better understanding of what it is you're going to look at, um, in that particular setting, you already know exactly where to look. So if they say that it's tooth 28, you can just go directly to the right mandible and look until you see something in that particular location. Whereas a radiologist getting it isn't necessarily going to have any information. They won't know um, what other information is present, and therefore they have to be a little bit more uh, diligent in how they approach it. Okay, let's go to um, polling question uh, number two. And in this particular case, um, the majority of odontogenic lesions are really associated with um, one of the remnants. And in this particular case, I would like to stress that this is not the widest variety, but is actually the greatest volume. So in other words, which odontogenic lesion has the greatest volume from which remnant? So dental lamina, uh, enamel epithelium, Hertwig root sheath, and the periodontal ligament. And so when you think about each of these particular structures, they're all involved in, of course, the 
endontogenesis and odontogenic development as a whole. Um, but some of these particular structures are likely to give rise to many more odontogenic lesions than anything else. So I'll give just a couple of seconds here for you guys to um, respond. Uh, I realize that the terminology may not be something that you have heard in a while, and so um, may not be quite as easy as um, the first question was. So I'll go ahead and close the poll in this particular case, and while it's bringing up the answers, I'll just show you that it is, in fact, um, Hertwig's root sheath. So in this particular case, um, that the structure is um, part of the immediately surrounding area with a tooth, and so all of the ridiculous cysts develop in that particular um, setting. They are immediately adjacent to the tooth, and they account for by far and away the vast majority of lesions that you come across. Whereas the reduced enamel epithelium is likely to give rise to dentigerous cysts, while the dental lamina is giving rise to the widest uh, variety of lesions, but of course these particular lesions are actually quite uncommon um, as far as overall odontogenic um, cysts and tumors go. So here is an example of that periodontal ligament um, containing some of the uh, remnants of the Hertwig's roof sheets. When you look at them on higher power, they give you this kind of rest of malaise. And in fact, if you look at all of them um, in aggregate here with um, a, court, a six set of images, you can really tell that there is quite a bit of variety in these odontogenic epithelial rests, and they really are um, quite harmless. They are almost always present somewhere in the adjacent fibrous connective tissue of any tooth that is removed, and so these are just to be discounted and ignored completely rather than trying to worry about are they possibly representing some sort of um, neoplasm or invasive growth pattern to the lesion. Okay, so I usually think that um, showing a case is often um, the best way in order to be able to recognize it. And so in this case, 29-year-old female during routine dental exam was found to have a swelling of the maxilla. Imaging was performed and a biopsy was obtained. And of course, you know, it's always nice to know who the patients are. This is clearly not the patient, but, you know, it just gives you an idea of the age in this particular case. So um, let's show you the histology. Um, not. So. I just want to show this for a second to highlight what I'm going to say. Several months ago in our greater Los Angeles area, and you can tell that this is involving Riverside County, Hesperia, Lancaster, and out into Barstow, was a remarkable um, Doppler uh, radar detection of a flash storm that was occurring over that particular area. And so it was reported that way out of the media, except no one was actually experiencing any rain or a storm. And so it took people actually going outside and looking at the sky themselves to see that there were just billions and billions of insects in the air. And it turned out that this was a ladybug swarm that had happened to come through that particular community at that time. And obviously was a mimic of what was actually going on on Doppler, ultra, uh, and Doppler radar. So whenever I look at these particular lesions, my um, diagnostic go-to is if I do not see imaging on a case, I will not give a diagnosis. And anyone here at Woodland Hills knows when they bring me a case, I always say, um, I am sure that that dentist's office has a fabulous uh, x-ray of this because dentists can charge for the x-ray. And therefore, they can also email it to you because all of them are using either cone beam CT or bite wing images that are all digitized now, and they will send it to you. And lo and behold, in less than a couple of hours, it image has actually been emailed to the requesting pathologist. So um, certainly within our own uh, area, we can access all of these through Health Connect and the imaging section. So I really just don't give um, a diagnosis unless imaging has been obtained. So with that in mind, I would like to just highlight some of the useless terminology that can be applied to these particular lesions because it basically says to the clinician that you do not know what you're looking at. Because just saying odontogenic epithelium is there or that it's an odontogenic cyst is basically saying, I recognize that you took a lesion out of the jaw that's cystic. And that's not a diagnosis at all. Um, in fact, I have seen several people write down jaw odontogenic cysts, so now we actually have um, a double negative sort of in that particular setting, which is also going to be meaningless. So I've put kind of equivalent terminology um, for what you may see in other anatomic sites as well, and to just say, you know, goiter or to say skin tumor present, all of these things don't really help the clinician at all and are not something that um, should be used in this particular context.
So now if you go to odontogenic cysts just in general, you will notice that about 90% of all odontogenic lesions are in fact cystic, with the remaining 10% being either odontogenic tumors, fibroosseous lesions, or perhaps even just native bone tumors such as osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma in that particular setting. So if you now look at the odontogenic cysts, they're usually classified into two major groups with the inflammatory and developmental. Um, with the inflammatory, the ridiculous cyst capacity whether it is a periapical cyst or residual cyst really accounts for the vast majority. Um, odontogenic keratocyst making up about 8% and then dentigerous and eruption cyst making up approximately 20%. So you can see that that particular cohort of about three different entities is going to account for the vast majority of any of the odontogenic cystic lesions that you're going to come across in your practice. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go back now to the patient, and here is the imaging finding for um, this particular uh, woman. You will notice that there is a large lesion that actually has expanded into the maxillary sinus and has, in fact, resulted in displacement of the tooth. Here it is seen on a different view where you can see that the tooth is completely displaced upward as this entire space here has been filled um, by the um, odontogenic lesion. So um, this is a example of the um, case, and here you can see uh, that they are just these very, very narrow fragments of epithelium. And as you drive it, um, I'll just go here for a second because I think all of you can see that if you look in this lower portion, you can tell that there is, in fact, um, respiratory-type epithelium uh, in the lower portion of the field. And that particular finding is because this tumor has expanded into the area of the maxillary sinus, and this is why you're going to see uh, respiratory-type epithelium. You'll notice a very thin plate of bone that is separating between these particular areas here with the plate over in this portion, and that just tells you that there is still an intact um, a separation between them, even though the odontogenic lesion has expanded into this area. So as I look at the um, epithelium just from this very low power, I think that you can all see that it is actually quite thin. There is not very much in the way of epithelial hyperplasia. I mean, I can go to another area like this where it's completely lost and has inflammation present in it, but I can assure you that the amount of inflammation that you get from an area that is um, inflamed is usually very limited. Um, this very nicely highlights one of the features for this particular tumor where you can see that there is a complete clefting and separation of the um, epithelium from the underlying stroma. And no matter where you look, you can see that same finding, although it's not always quite as well developed, but you can see that there are no reedy ridges or extensions of the epithelium into the underlying stroma. So it's a very narrow um, portion of epithelium in this particular space. So then I go and look at the um, higher magnification, and as you go along in this particular setting, I think that it's quite easy to see um, that there is a very uh, thin epithelium. There is a very small basal uh, collection that is present um, along this area that has a slightly columnar appearance. And then you will notice this very prominent eosinophilic parakeratinized layer. Now, one of the things <clears throat> that's very nice um, with are reviewing these is um, if you drop the substage condenser and focus up and down, you will notice that it becomes extraordinarily refractile. So here you can see that it becomes very bright in signal. If I bring the substage condenser back up and focus again, you will notice as you drop it and focus down, it has this remarkable refractility to it. And I think that that particular finding is very, very helpful in separating between the various odontogenic cystic uh, lesions, whether they are tumors or uh, reactions. Active, um, developmental cysts because it is just not a finding that you really see reproducibly in any of the other lesions. Now, it's not going to be in every single field. You know, if I went over here, it's not quite as well developed. I mean, if I drop the substage condenser and focus up and down, I think that you can see it is still refractile. But for the most part, um, it is something that is fairly easy to be able to identify in this lesion. So with that in mind, um, odontogenic keratocyst is what I have just shown, and in this particular case, it is you know, one of the most uh, distinctive um, odontogenic cysts, very uh, considered to be locally aggressive. And one of the things that's really interesting about it, of course, is it is thought to be associated and well-developed um, association with the nevoid basal cell uh, carcinoma syndrome or Gorlin syndrome, if you prefer the eponym. 
So this is also a tumor that arises from the dental lamina, and I'll show that um, here in just a few moments. But um, it is uh, much more common at an earlier age in presentation when the patients are syndrome-associated versus when they are not syndrome-associated. So if you have someone who's presenting, let's say, at um, 11 or 12, the chance that it is syndrome-associated is going to be significantly higher than if they're presenting um, in their late 30s. Again, the mandible is um, very frequently associated with these particular tumors, and you will see that it is 75% of the lesions. So if you look at a diagrammatic representation of the radicular cyst across the top and then the follicular cyst on the left-hand side, um, it's actually the carotid cyst that we're going to discuss here. And so with remnants of the dental lamina that undergo either a cystic degeneration or an epithelial proliferation, they will then advance in to form a large cystic structure. And that particular cystic structure is actually not usually associated with the tooth in any way. So it may be adjacent, it may be underlying, but in general, there is not an incorporation of the tooth into it unless it actually displaces the tooth as part of the underlying growth. So radiographically, it's going to give you a really well-defined and unilocular radiolucency. Um, it has kind of a slightly corticated border, which means that there's a well-developed margin. So it's not a destructive lesion. Um, there'll be bony expansion. So in other words, um, you may see that there is going to be bone that continues to be deposited upon the advancing edge, but in general, it is not a lesion that has bone destruction associated with it. And then, of course, um, if they are larger lesions, multilocularity may develop um, over time. So here is a diagrammatic representation. You can see that it's between the tooth roots of this particular lesion extending down into um, the rest of the jaw, a very large uh, cyst in the ramus of the mandible here, with uh, the tooth immediately adjacent, and yet not being incorporated into this large cystic space. Another example here, you can see that the patient is edentulous, and yet here is a very large, uh, well-defined radiolucency in this particular uh, portion of the mandible. This is an example that is expanded into the uh, maxillary sinus, and you can tell that it really is um, quite a large and um, expansile lesion as it has gone into the um, maxillary sinus. One of the things I'll point out is you'll notice that the medial wall of the maxillary sinus is still intact. It has not been broken through. The bone has expanded as the tumor or the cyst has expanded into it, but it has not actually been um, destroyed. So let me just say for a moment that the odontogenic keratocyst is part of the autosomal dominant disorder, which is with the patch 1 tumor suppressor gene. And so the patch 1 is not um, active because it has some sort of mutation. This results in SMO not being um, produced, and therefore GLE-1 is not being expressed either. So it is an entire pathway of mutation that is usually seen in the syndrome association, but those same findings are very frequently identified as well as sporadic mutations in um, odontogenic keratocyst. And so I think um, with those type of genetic findings present in it and part of a syndrome, um, it, it is probably better to think of these particular lesions as being um, a genuine tumor rather than, or a neoplasm rather than just thinking of them as um, a cyst. There are many things that are part of the neboid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Obviously, basal cell carcinoma is one of them. They tend to be young at age um, at the initial presentation, and they're usually located in areas that are not typically sun-exposed, so it's a different manifestation. And then, of course, the skeletal anomalies with bifid ribs and uh, mandibular prognathism, uh, frontal bossing, palmar and plantar pitting, uh, medulloblastoma, and some other findings. But you will notice that having multiple clinically recurring or um, uh, bilateral disease of the keratocystic odontogenic tumor group um, is seen in about 75% of the patients. So it really is a very, very common finding in these particular uh, patients. So diagrammatically, multiple lesions are present. When you look at the radiology, you will notice that there are three topographically distinct and separate lesions in the jaw of this patient. Here is another example where there is a tumor here. You can tell that it is actually absorbing the roots, and another one that is um, incorporating and absorbing the roots um, immediately adjacent to it, again, also in the mandible of this patient. Multiple lesions are present here. Um, 
both the maxilla and mandible with two different tumors. Obviously, there are also um, uh, uninvolved uh, teeth where they have been impacted. And of course, uh, this is not an abnormality that you're looking at um, histologically, but it is still something that can be seen in these patients since they do tend to be um, fairly young at initial pre uh, presentation. And so all of their teeth may not yet have um, erupted. This is just to show um, a representation of two tumors in the jaw here, but this is a medulloblastoma seen on um, imaging. There is calcification of the fox cerebri that can be seen here, and then those palmar and plantar pitting that are actually quite characteristic for the syndrome as well. Now, the tumors can be quite remarkably large. You know, I mean, this is an example of a mandible cyst um, in the operating theater. And you can tell that, you know, it is a huge lesion um, in this particular patient. And you can tell that from what I've already shown um, with the imaging findings. So it is not something that necessarily is just a small and inconsequential lesion. They often will have to have quite disfiguring surgery in order to be able to remove the lesion completely. So histologically, no reedy ridges. Um, artifactual clusting that separates the epithelium from the adjacent stroma, often with a lumen that's filled with keratinaceous debris, and then this very characteristic thin lining that has a basal palisade of epithelial cells um, that is present at the basal zone. And then probably the most helpful um, feature in this is, of course, that wavy or corrugated parakeratosis that is quite refractile. They don't tend to be um, inflamed very often, and Russian bodies may be seen, which are these very brightly refractile curvilinear bodies of keratin. So this is, looks very similar to what I just showed um, in the example I drove a few moments ago. Here you can tell abundant keratin debris is present within this particular lesion that has a lot of multi-locular uh, cysts. So in other words, there are many daughter cysts present in this particular case, and that is more likely to be seen in a syndrome association. Here you will see that there is clefting artifact immediately adjacent with this palisade of small columnar, short columnar cells at the basal zone, and then keratin debris is present here within the lumen. Here is an example of that refractile um, keratin. Again, in this case, I was able to take the photograph initially and then drop the substage condenser and take it again, and you can tell that there really is quite a remarkable difference as you focus up and down with that substage condenser drop down, giving you that bright refractility. So it definitely is something that you should look for um, in every one of the cases. When you have multiple cysts like this that are seen um, deeper into the epithelium, uh, into the stroma, here you will see epithelium deep in the stroma, um, epithelium deep in the stroma, and obviously these two here. This is almost always going to be a syndrome-associated finding. Another example here where you have multiple, uh, the term daughter cyst is used most frequently, and here you have many, many cysts that are present quite deep in the um, underlying stroma. This is very characteristic for syndrome association, and whenever I see it, I will comment that a syndrome needs to be excluded in that particular patient. Here is an example of Russian bodies. They are um, very, very characteristic with this kind of curvilinear keratin deposition. And again, just like you have that um, hyperkeratosis that has a refractile quality, the same thing here. If you focus up and down with the substage condenser, you'll have a nice refractility. Now, because it is a proliferative lesion, I'm not saying you need to do key 67, but just so you know that there is a proliferation going on. It's usually just the basal zone that is affected, but it definitely is a lesion that is expanding and growing um, over time. So surgery is the treatment of choice. Lots and lots of recurrences, though, develop in this particular lesion. Much more frequently when it is syndrome-associated, but just be aware that um, no matter what they seem to do, even with the on-block resections, they do tend to have a very high rate of um, local recurrence. Malignant transformation has been described, but it's super uncommon in these particular cases. So uh, several lesions are raised in the differential, and we're going to talk about each of these here in a few moments with the radiculous cyst, um, which really encompasses periapical cyst as well, associated with a non-vital tooth, and then finally the dentigerous cyst. So what I'm going to do um, later on after the lecture has concluded is I'm going to send out this particular um, um, chart because I think if you're sitting at your desk and struggling with a case, uh, just looking at some of these particular criteria for each of the tumors as to where you are and what you're going to be discussing may be quite helpful. As you'll notice here, we've just discussed the odontogenic keratocyst and sort of compared it to um, periapical cyst, and so I'll go into periapical cyst now a little bit more. But just be aware that 
kind of having it all highlighted in one place sometimes makes it a little bit easier to um, see which features may or may not be present or absent as you look at those particular um, findings. So with the periapical cyst, it is um, always associated with the radicular surface of a non-vital tooth. And so for me, knowing what the tooth's vitality is is very clinically important. And if I don't have that information, again, it's going to be hard to reach a diagnosis in that instance. It's usually got a stratified squamous epithelium and then, of course, lots and lots of inflammation associated with it because, in general, a periapical cyst and periapical granuloma are just an arc of development of the same lesion as it undergoes various inflammatory uh, reactions as a result of the death of the pulp. So if you think about um, radicular cyst in general, periapical is at the apex of the tooth, right at the opening of the root canal. Lateral is adjacent to the tooth wall, and then residual is kind of between um, teeth in this particular case. So um, let me show you an example of one. So here you can see um, just an intermediate power where you can tell that there is a central lumen to this particular cyst. And in this example, you can tell that there is um, an epithelial lining to it. Um, interestingly, there is not much in the way of a proliferation deep into the stroma, so it is confined to the surface epithelium, whether you're looking on either side of these particular um, cystic spaces. But I think all of you can tell that this is a very, very heavy um, inflammatory reaction in this particular um, instance. And when you look at the um, inflammatory reaction lining it, you will notice that there are lots of histiocytes. And so kind of the idea of periapical granuloma is what is meant by using that particular term, where you have a very rich inflammatory infiltrate, um, usually in the surface epithelium, but also immediately subtending all of the epithelium. When you go and look at the epithelium specifically, I think you will notice that it is usually remarkably um, bland in its overall appearance. This does not really have any palisading at the edge. There's not a suggestion that there are umbrellas cells, you don't have reverse polarization, so you don't have any of the other criteria that you would like to think of when you're talking about some of the other cystic lesions that can develop um, in this anatomic site. So um, if you think about um, the uh, development of these lesions radiographically, here you can tell that this particular area has a very large space that is um, caries. So in other words, this tooth has been completely destroyed through dental caries or a cavity formation. You can tell that the uh, normal tooth root that goes down is completely destroyed. And here you can see a very nice area of the um, periapical um, granuloma. When you look at it histologically, this shows you very nicely that you do have have a lot of inflammatory infiltrate present here, immediately adjacent to um, a dead tooth. Another example here where it's just between two teeth, but again, you can tell a very large cystic space present in that particular region. Another example here with an epithelial lining associated with a very um, well-developed inflammatory infiltrate. Sometimes cholesterol clefts will be seen, and even other times you may get a whole bunch of rhomboid-type crystals as part of the degenerated phenomenon. And of course, um, you can have Russian bodies as degenerating keratin um, in this particular case as well, and it is not going to change your underlying diagnosis. Okay, so um, we'll go on now to question number three, and in this particular uh, sample, I would like to say what are the most important factors that are required for a diagnosis of an atic lesion. And you will see that I have five choices here. Um, I will know which one of you select E if that's what you do, and then you will be hearing from me afterwards, which I have been told is not always the most desirable of experiences. But with that in mind, um, imaging, lesion location, tooth association or vitality, and then all of the above, or sending it out for a consult. So in this uh, sample, I'll give it another couple few moments here for people to um, respond. And I think, you know, in this instance, all of you are going to get the question correct because it really is very obvious that you really need to have all of the above with the imaging findings, the location, um, as well as the tooth association and or vitality. <clears throat> so let's go on now to another example of a um, lesion. This particular case is taken from a 31-year-old male patient who had uh, pain in the jaw for the past several months. Dental exam showed a swelling in the mandible, and a panorex was included with a biopsy performed. Um, here is the patient, and more importantly, here is the imaging. And I'll let you look at that for a few moments. Um, I'll highlight it with a nice yellow dot, and then uh, let's go and actually look at the um, findings. 
So in this instance, uh, there is a boatload of inflammation. And I sort of purposely wanted to include one of these cases because I think this is the more reality-oriented sampling where you do have a lot of epithelium, but you also have a lot of inflammation that is associated with it. If you go and look at this on uh, kind of an intermediate power, I think you can see that there is really just a whole lot of inflammatory infiltrate present in this particular uh, field. Um, immediately adjacent to it is this epithelium. You will notice that there is a stromal reaction, but it's kind of tangentially sectioned in this area. So I try to go to areas where maybe there is not as much tangential sectioning. So here you can see much more of an epithelial lining and the adjacent um, surrounding stroma in this uh, field. But you will tell now that the epithelium is inflamed. But as you look at it um, in the areas that don't have as much inflammation, it's actually quite a very thin epithelium in this uh, region, um, not very much in the way of um, cytologic atypia at all. There's no evidence here that you have any sort of reverse polarization. I don't see any evidence of anything going on at the surface as far as, far as a parakeratinized layer, and I also don't see um, any other findings to suggest that it may be some sort of other neoplasm in this example. So um, when you look at these particular cases, this is an example of a dentigerous cyst. And I think in this um, case, again, the dentigerous cyst as an entity is defined by the fact that it is forming at the crown junction, crown root junction of a unerupted tooth. The imaging in this particular case showed a very nice example of a tooth that was dead center with the crown projecting into the lumen. And so even though there is a lot of information present in this case, you still are able to tell that you really are dealing with um, a, a dentigerous cyst that is inflamed because it doesn't really matter what the epithelium looks like as far as its proliferative nature. It is still very bland in its overall appearance. So most common of the developmental cysts, wide age range of presentation with a slight male predilection, and of course, in the mandible, the third molars are the most common location, and in the maxilla, the maxillary canines are usually involved in that instance. Usually they are small and asymptomatic with expansion of the bone, sometimes re resorption of the adjacent teeth. Um, importantly, from an imaging standpoint, this is again where I think that that radiolucency that is immediately associated with the crown of an unerupted tooth and comes in at that crown root junction is going to be the key to the diagnosis no matter what. Now, you know, there's always going to be a minor component of um, radiology uh, imaging that may not be directly in the plane of section, or the tooth may not be exactly where you want it to be when you're looking at it. So you do have to take that into consideration, just like we do tangential sectioning when we're looking at histology. But with that in mind, that particular finding of the junction of the crown root um, is the most helpful and probably significant finding in a dentigerous cyst overall. So here you will notice diagrammatically, here is the tooth and it is pushed into the space of the cyst exactly the way you can see in the example here of an imaging radiology where the cyst, and you'll notice the cyst has expanded beyond just the confines of this particular tooth, but you can see that that tooth is directly in, inside um, that cystic radiolucency. Another example, this is what I just showed a few moments ago where you can see that there is a tooth root junction and here you can tell the cyst coming off in that particular space and filling in the entire area. So just to highlight it, if you're looking at a bite wing image, here you can see the tooth root junction and that's exactly where the cyst is starting and you can tell that the cyst has now surrounded um, this region. Now it's very idealized to have me show you a gross photo like this because no one ever takes them out, but if they do take it out intact, you will see that the tooth is actually completely inside um, the cystic area. Another example here to show that it really is at this very nice tooth um, enamel root junction and you can see this large cystic area surrounding uh, the tooth with the crown present inside it. Now histologically you can see this as well. Uh, this is an example of a tooth. You'll see that it is present inside the cyst. Here is the cyst lining and if you capitalize on that particular area and look at it at higher power you can see that it is exactly at that tooth root junction um, uh, with the um, enamel that you see that particular finding with a very thin epithelium in this example. So it is um, a very characteristic presentation. Of course you're never going to see the tooth this way. And the reason for that is most of the um, sectioning when it's done by either the PAs or the pathologists is 
The hard material is removed and many times not even submitted. This is one of the mistakes in dental pathology. If you do not have the hard material submitted with it, you're not going to be able to come up with an accurate diagnosis of the relationship to the, what's going on with the rest of the tooth structure. So if that is not your practice at your local area, I would highly recommend that you get your PAs to submit all of the tissue. It doesn't have to be in the same cassette. All of the material for decal can be placed in a separate cassette if you don't want to have this nice junction um, that you are able to see. But just know that in general, you really do need to be able to say that um, the hard tissues have been examined in this example. <clears throat> So from a pathology perspective, it's usually a very, very thin um, uh, epithelium, two to four layers thick um, in the non-inflamed circumstance with a non-keratinized epithelial lumen, uh, fibrous connective tissue surrounding it. But of course, the inflamed, which is like the case I just showed presently, it's much more difficult to come up with a diagnosis in that case because it is just a, a lot of inflammation that causes the cyst to undergo an epithelial transformation or hyperplasia. You can see Russian bodies in hypoplastic epithelium. Mucocytes can be seen. Sometimes you can even see ciliated or sebaceous cells, and that does not change the underlying diagnosis. It is just something that can be seen within the dentigerous cyst category. Um, many times, a, a jontogenic um, rest will be found in the adjacent fibrous connective tissue as well. So an example here with a very thin epithelial lining. This is a non-inflamed area um, and quite characteristic for dentigerous cyst. Another example here where a very thin epithelial lining, several layers thick, but no palisading, no peripheral um, palisade, no separation artifact to speak of. It has not got a parakeratinized layer and there's no reverse polarization. Another example where you can see that it is um, very, very thin epithelium without a nice parakeratinized layer either that would put you into a different category. So of course, when the epithelium becomes inflamed, it becomes, becomes a little bit more hyperplastic. Here is an example that's much more hyperplastic where you can see that it is now filling into the lumen with a lot of cholesterol cleft formation as the blood is undergoing organization. And then another final example here where you can see that the epithelium um, in the upper left-hand corner is intimately associated with all of this inflammation. It is still a bland overall squamous epithelium, but you can tell how it is much more hyperplastic plastic with elongation of the reedy ridges. Many times the cholesterol clefts will be present throughout, not just in the surface, but actually in the stroma as well. And this is just organization going on in the underlying area where the cyst contents um, have been uh, taken up into the um, stroma. Again, the epithelium is usually exceptionally thin. There's nothing remarkable about it at all, and it's more of the negative criteria that are able to get you to a positive diagnosis in this particular um, lesion category. Finally, just to show you that you can have mucinous metaplasia. So here you can see a dentigerous cyst with very well-formed um, muc uh, mucocytes present within it. They tend to be luminally oriented like this, and there isn't any other sort of cytologic atypia. There's no evidence of an infiltrating pattern, and so a central mucoepidermoid carcinoma is not likely to be seen in this particular setting. Of course, you can have mucoepidermoid carcinoma in the odontogenic um, apparatus, but it is quite rare and has a very different overall pattern than what you see just with isolated mucocytes present like this. So careful enucleation, extraction with um, perhaps even having to put in a prosthesis if necessary, but many times they will try to actually um, preserve the tooth. Um, so they'll just take out the cyst in this way. Uh, you do have to actually look at the radiology in order to get that association um, with the tooth structure. And so dentigerous cyst here is um, the third of the lesions that we have gone over um, in this particular diagram. So let's go on now to polling question number four, and um, which of the lesions has the highest rate of recurrence? So this is really, out of all of the lesions that we're going to be discussing today, what is the one that has the highest rate of um, recurrence? This can be either ameloblastoma, dentigerous cyst, odontogenic keratocyst, and periapical cyst. And I will say, for those of you that have been looking at that particular table that I have put up each time, um, the answers are actually in there because, of course, they're covering the entire bottom. And so when you get it back, you'll be able to look at this in a little bit more detail um, than what you've seen uh, at this juncture. So um, I'll go ahead and um, close the poll at this time, uh, just in the interest of trying to finish in a timely fashion. 
um, and the vast majority of people have gotten this particular answer correct, and that is an odontogenic keratocyst. So of all of the lesions, this is the one that has the highest rate of recurrence. As you can tell, for a periapical cyst, the, the tooth is dead, right? So they take the tooth out, so it's never going to recur because the whole lesion has been removed, and therefore you're not likely to have it um, come back. So that was kind of just a throwaway in this um, case. So let's go to uh, case uh, number four. In this case, 34-year-old, right jaw swelling, dental exam showed a mandibular swelling, um, a panorex was performed, and a biopsy was done. So um, let's go and look first at the imaging before we uh, look at the uh, histology. And here you can see that there is a really large um, unilocular cystic lesion. Um, it is immediately adjacent to uh, the tooth right here. You can tell that it is filling into the ramus of the mandible and is completely expanding down into this particular space. So um, it is a really, really uh, large um, a tumor in this example. So, you know, when you look at the histology from something like that and you're like, really? That's all you're going to give me is this one little itty bitty strip of nothingness? And yet that's what you were seeing radiographically. So it can be um, quite a disconnect when you look at some of these lesions to say, wow, you know, it looked so um, ominous and yet here histologically it doesn't really have that appearance. So um, just a very, very narrow fibrous connective tissue um, present, and in this um, lesion, you'll notice that the uh, area of interest is on either side, and so that's what we'll go and have a look at here um, on slightly higher power. So whenever I look at, again, the um, lesions for the jaw, I usually try to look at the entire space to get a feel for what is it I'm seeing? What's the epithelium look like? Is it atypical? Is it not? Is there palisading or not? Is there reverse polarization or not? And is there parakeratinization or not? What's going on at the surface? So as I look at this um, example here, um, I think that um, all of you can see, uh, even at this um, sort of low intermediate power, um, there are these very well-developed umbrella cells. And those particular umbrella cells are quite remarkable and helpful. Uh, I do think that you will notice that there is even some subnuclear vacuolization. I'll go up to high power because I know that they are often doubters in the group. So here you can see subnuclear vacuolization. Now, as I move along, uh, you can tell that it is a very subtle finding. It is present um, in several areas, but it is certainly not uniform. In other words, if I look at an area here, I can't show you any area of subnuclear vacuolization in that particular one high power field. But as I move along and I see that it has it again over here with this very um, large umbrella type cell present above it. And then as I move along the entire surface, you will notice that this um, epithelium, oops, this epithelium becomes um, quite a bit more thickened or proliferative, but still looks um, like a large umbrella cell covering it. This area looks a bit um, spongiotic in appearance. They're very, very prominent intercellular bridges and borders. And again, I think you can see that there is a space underneath each of these nuclei as they have um, polarized away from uh, the basement membrane and then just a final area here to show that particular epithelial proliferation that has come into the lumen of this case. So um, it, we're now down to kind of the last um, segment of this where you're talking about relationship to the dental lamina. In this case, we're going to talk about ameloblastoma, which is the locally aggressive um, epithelial odontogenic tumor. So this is actually the most common of the odontogenic tumors. It's not the most common of the cyst, but it is the most common of the neoplasms or tumors um, as uh, just after odontoma. So if you're really going to talk about um, clinical presentation for these lesions, um, the odontogenic Odontoma is something that usually presents um, in the 10 to 15 year age range um, where it's just a multiple uh, minor tooth structures that are very easy to detect radiographically and so they often do not take those particular um, specimens out. Um, equal age distribution, again, the mandible is the most common location for this tumor, although they are slightly different depending on which particular histologic variant may be there. And so I think you can see that desmoplastic um, ameloblastoma is more likely to be seen in the um, anterior um, maxillary portion. 
Uh, surgery is usually um, conservative, but again, you can get recurrences of these lesions. Um, generally, it's up to around 35%. But in this particular context of the lecture um, for this evening, because I'm trying to focus on those lesions that have a cystic appearance, and in this case, it is a unicystic amyloblastoma, um, those generally do not have a very high incidence of um, local recurrence. Radiographically, um, for the classic amyloblastoma, they tend to have a very multilocular or soap bubble type appearance, giving you this expansile radiolucency, while in the unicystic lesions, obviously, they do not have all of those interloculations um, uh, uh, in the cyst. The teeth can be impacted, they can be separated around, they may have tooth resorption, and again, the bone tends to not be destroyed, but it is very common to have cortical expansion from it. So here you can see diagrammatically uh, kind of that soap bubble type appearance, and when you look at the radiology, you can tell that it is really super with multiple little radiographic bubbles um, that are all interjoined with one another. Another example here in a specimen radiograph where you can see multiple um, loculations present giving kind of that soap bubble type appearance. Um, I mean, I think this is a very classic example here in the left mandible where you just have a boatload of these very nice um, areas of radio um, lucency, giving you a soap bubble appearance. So again, one of the things that I would like to highlight here is when you look at these, and I think you should look at the radiology. I don't think just reading the report is enough because I can tell you from having read them, most of the radiologists in our group are not dental radiologists, and they, therefore they will say um, the lesion will be interpreted by the dentist or the oral surgeon, no fracture seen. That's it. They won't say anything else. So the example, the uh, advantage that you have, again, is because you know that it is a left mandibular resection. You come here to the left. Oh, look, there I see the lesion. So it's usually fairly easy to come up with a correlation because you already know where the lesion is and what you need to go and look at um, to find it uh, radiographically. Very large multilocular lesion here. Again, a different example where it's shown here on CT, a unilocular lesion identified here just to show you that um, they do just have a single large space um, rather than having multiple um, uh, soap bubbles in this example. And then a final example just to show that these can be really, really large and expanding into the sinonasal tract in this particular instance, expanding into the maxillary sinus. So when you look at the imaging, um, the soap bubble is there and you'll notice that there is um, a tooth present that has been compressed out to the uh, periphery and then when you look at the gross specimen of that, you can tell that the tooth is present over here with this large area that gives you kind of a glistening um, overall appearance to it. So lots and lots of different patterns with amyloblastoma, but the things that you really are likely to see is that there is a peripheral palisade of the amyloblastic cells that give you this kind of jigsaw puzzle. The basal cells are arranged in an anastomosing or plexiform pattern with reverse polarization of those basal columnar cells away from the stroma. So this is that subnuclear vacuolization that is so characteristic for the tumor. Um, Finally, the central loosely arranged stellate reticulum, this is, again, something that can undergo a variety of different changes. Um, squamous differentiation is probably the most common, but just recognize that a basaloid or granular appearance can also be seen um, in these uh, lesions. So with that in mind, I've put down some of the variants at the bottom. I'll highlight just a few of them so that you've seen them, but just be aware that there are actually quite a number of um, histologic variants to amyloblastoma. This is the follicular where you're most likely to see it. This is the most common of the uh, amyloblastomas. I think you can tell that it has a very nice um, a plexiform arrangement. There is an anastomosing between them with the subnuclear vacuolization. Another example here of the palisading of the nuclei out towards the periphery around the stellate central reticulum, sometimes undergoing cystic degeneration. And yet you can still see that very nice subnuclear vacuolization because it creates a clearing um, at the junction with the epithelium. Now, in this case, there is going to be some evidence of destruction and growth. So many times it will destroy the tooth root. Here you can see part of the dentin and enamel matrix present in the tooth here that was incorporated to it. And here is some of the bone in the adjacent tissue um, in this resection specimen where you have the amyloblastoma intimately associated with these structures. 
a nice example here of a um, plexiform pattern with multiple different arborizing areas of um, what look like glandular epithelium uh, and central areas of degeneration in the reticular, um, in the stellate reticulum. Very nice uh, palisading, usually easy to identify, uh, beautifully accentuated in this particular field. Squamous differentiation can be quite prominent. In that case, we use the term acanthomatous. Another example here showing a very well-developed acanthomatous appearance to it. Um, in fact, it's a bit more difficult to see the ameloblastic epithelium, but when you look at the ameloblastic epithelium here, you can tell that they are areas of subnuclear vacuolization and clearing, even in this particular space. Now, many times, if you think about wherever they are, sometimes that keratinization will strip off into the lumen, uh, where you have some of those umbrella cells present with these very nice and well-formed intercellular borders. Um, it looks very similar to what you see in a craniopharyngioma, actually. So if you didn't know where you were and you were thinking, could it be craniopharyngioma, um, at least bring to mind the possibility of something like an ameloblastoma. Just to highlight a couple of areas with that subnuclear vacuolization, because again, it is one of the most helpful features in separating between the various odontogenic cysts and neoplasms. A nice example here, again, with that stellate reticulum present in the center. So um, I will show the uh, area of a unicystic ameloblastoma. This is identical to the case that I drove just a few moments ago, where you can see that it has these umbrella cells. So quite similar to what you see in the uh, urologic tract, and you have these very enlarged cells that overlie the rest of the urothelium. Whenever I see very, very large cells disproportionately to the rest of the epithelium, I always think I need to exclude an ameloblastoma and the unicystic variant specifically. Here is a super high power just to show you that there is reverse polarization in this example, and yet this is all that you see in that particular area. So sometimes you have to look at all of the tissue and look quite long and hard in order to be able to see it. The desmoplastic variant is really difficult to come up with a diagnosis because it does look like this, where there's only a very minimal amount of stellate reticulum in the, press, in the center, and it is often very difficult to be able to see any areas of reverse polarization, and so you really have to look at a lot of the tumor in order to be able to identify it. Granular cell variant is quite uncommon as well, but it can be seen with just a change in the cytoplasm giving you a granular nature. And finally, the basal variant here giving a similar appearance to basal cell adenoma or perhaps even to an adenoid cystic carcinoma um, in this uh, single high power field. So when you think about the genetics of ameloblastoma, there are actually several different pathways. The most common is the sonic hedgehog pathway, and that gives rise to, um, again, uh, SMO being overexpressed with GLE2 and either GLE2 or GLE1 being overexpressed. But you can also have alterations in the WINT pathway or in the um, MAC kinase pathway, either one of those being present. And you will notice here I have um, BRAF included in that MAP kinase pathway. So, there is a subset of ameloblastoma that will have a BRAF mutation present in it. So by whichever pathway you come to get the particular tumor, any one of these may be seen, and there are differences depending upon the variant of the tumor as to which one you're likely to have. So again, when you're in the jaw of basaloid squamous cell carcinoma may need to be considered. Basal cell adenoma and even pleomorphic adenoma or adenoid cystic may sometimes come into the differential as well. But in general, um, none of these particular tumor categories will have that very well-developed um, subnuclear vacuolization. Um, about a year ago, uh, the ICCR, or International Collaboration on Cancer Reporting, um, got together and put out a odontogenic guide. So as you know, there is not a staging or grading or anything else um, currently with the CAP, but the ICCR has put out one. And if you ever want to go to the um, ICCR website, it is actually quite helpful to be able to look through the various parameters that need to be um, recorded if you're struggling with an amyloblastic lesion. And so here we've finished up now with the unicystic ameloblastoma as an entity in the cystic lesions that I've tried to present this evening um, with the characteristic findings. So again, I will send this out um, as an email. Um, in fact, I have just sent it because, you know, you're supposed to do more than two things at once whenever you're giving a lecture, um, hence the reason for doing the polling and driving the slide and everything else. So hopefully that did go out and not botch up. So in Closing, always, always, always match the radiology to the histology. Um, and if you don't have any radiology, you really shouldn't give a diagnosis. You need to bang on them until they give it to you. 
The most common indices are the most common. I know this is like a very dark statement, and I hesitated to put it in. But if you are struggling with the case, I mean, think about the things that are the most common first, because it's likely to fit into those rather than one of these rare esoteric things. And then if you don't know, um, call a clinician, call the dentist, call the oral surgeon, call whoever is involved, and try and get additional information. Even go and look at the imaging with the radiologist if you need to in order to be able to get it. And so I'll end um, the talk with this. Um, photo that I took um, in Dubai, uh, we had the opportunity to go up the Burj Khalifa, which is actually the tallest building in the world at the time, and be able to uh, be up there for an extended time because it was one of their national holidays. But the reason I'm showing this is because if you sit with the NASA cysts for some time and just let them grow on you, you will actually see a much more different appearance to it if you um, watch it over time and be able to become more familiar with the diagnostic terminology. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions. I do have the chat box open, and um, Elizabeth, if you can just unmute everyone so that if they have a question, they can ask it rather than uh, trying to have a person ask and not be able to do so. So I don't see anything in the chat box, and I'm not hearing from anyone, so either that's a good sign or not. Okay, if there are no questions, thanks very much, and I hope you have a good evening, and um, good luck with the NASA Thanks, Lester. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.